Welcome back to another season and another edition of The Carousel, your number one spot for all the latest news, rumors, scoop, gossip in the basketball coaching carousel. Joined, as always, by the great Brian Burton. B, hello, sir. How are you? I, I understand you've been shoveling snow all morning. Shoveling snow is real out here. It's, it's, it's real life snow. I'm not just wearing this for effect. I'm still <laughs> cold. I'm still cold from being outside, so you guys got to deal with it. Well, anytime the snow comes in means it's basketball season. We're sitting here early February. Uh, it's that time of year where where jobs begin to open. You start hearing some rumors, some rumblings. Of course, as always, this show, the purpose of it is not to glorify all the coaching changes. Uh, we've all been there. We've all been fired. Uh, we have a lot of respect for the, anybody in this profession. We're just here to share news and rumors because there is so much uh, lack of information. Information is more than half the battle when you're trying to find a job. So we wanted to shed some light on it. Uh, and, and B, we had a catchphrase last year that we would start every show <laughs> with. <laughs> and unfortunately, bro, I'm going to I'm gonna have to retire it. Um, as our search and consulting business like grows, it's yes. probably not a great look for me to be dropping F-bombs left yes. and right. Yes. It's cool. I'm still going to sneak them in here and there. But as <laughs> like the beginning of the show, probably not a great look. But I'm going to do it one more time. Just for, for the time. fans Just at home. Time. Drop the mic. Just for the fans at home. Last time I'm going to do this. Um, <laughs> you know, the best part about this show, B, uh, is neither of us coach anymore. So when we can talk, when we talk about these open jobs, we're free to talk freely because we don't give a fuck. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> it's tired. I'm glad I got one more in. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that part of the show. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, good show today. We're, we got lots to talk about. We're going to talk more about the Louisville uh, opening. We're going to talk Maryland. We got some mid-major jobs that are open that that have some interims in place now to talk that. about. Um, but let's start off with uh, what, we, what we've been focusing on all this month, February, Black History Month. Yep. We have launched our National Equality and Inclusion Night campaign. Hashtag Equality and Inclusion Night. Um, and it's really been incredible, man. We've already had some schools uh, started off for us. Uh, Binghamton is having their equality and inclusion night tonight. Um, and, and Brian, you've got a guest on your DEI spotlight this week who really kicked off the campaign. Tell us about about that. Yeah, she's actually, uh, by the time this airs, I can talk like this now since it's pre-recorded. But by the time this airs, it'll already be on the timeline and on the YouTube uh, Rising Coaches TV. But uh, yeah, Coach Coach Howard over at Georgia Southern. She's the first one to kick it off. They normally start celebrating Black History Month in the at the end of January. She said so. They wanted to get it kicked off that way, and she was really fired up about it. She was excited to support it, and uh, she talks all about it. If you go to the DEI or to the Rising Coaches, like I said, uh, Rising Coaches TV, and she did a great job kind of breaking it down and things they do in their program and why they love representing with the pins and got some great pictures of it. And yeah, it was, it was a beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. And what we're asking teams to do is we're asking the coaching staffs to wear all black on the sideline to represent unity. And then we created these equal sign lapel pins <laughs> to symbolize equality. Um, and really just determined to keep this conversation, you know, in the national spotlight. Um, there was so much great right. activism in 2020, after the killing of George Floyd, uh, both all of us came. The whole coaching community came together. We held some amazing virtual uh, social justice roundtables, which I was thinking about the other day. B, we probably need, should do another virtual social justice roundtable here in the spring. Um, but the purpose of this was to keep that that momentum and that energy alive. We're two years removed from it. Um, we don't want that energy to wane. <laughs> a lot more work to be done for equality. And so this is just our way of, of drawing attention to it. We're going to have close to 100 games across the country um, hosting an equality and inclusion night on their campus between February 10th through the 24th are the official dates. There's some schools doing it early, like we mentioned. I think I'm doing it right. Uh, pretty incredible, B. And I know you've been you've been on the horn all, all week talking to different coaches who uh, trying to spread awareness. What's What's the reaction been like? I think the coolest part has been 
very few people have hesitation about it. Uh, and probably some of the people I kind of already know, either they're in one of the groups in our alliance or uh, they've spoken on a social justice roundtable or attended one. So I kind of have somewhat strategically gone to people that I thought would be behind it. But it's just been cool to see how much people rally behind it at all levels, you know, from the pro level to the high school level to the junior college level, NAI. I think that part's been a cool um, people saying things like, just tell me what I need to do. You know, or just tell me what you want us, what, what, what's what's the ask. And I think that part has been cool. It's like, yeah, we want to do it. What do we need to do? So I'm excited about just kind of where it goes. I think more than anything, similar to the social justice roundtables and the, the activism that we all were trying to do to raise awareness, uh, it just helps bring the conversation back up that, you know, I think most of us during that time felt like we just don't want it to die because we've all been in that situation before at some point where you felt like, Okay, this is a main conversation and then it just fades and then it becomes a main conversation again and then it fades. And, you know, somewhat strategically, I won't get into politics, but sometimes it's around uh, elections and politics. And unfortunately, people use those things as leverage sometimes. And then they find a way to push it back out of the way or the media is not covering it as much or um, so I think that part is just the cool part of we, we continue to do this and grow this is that just keeps it inside in mind and each individual school and people within those schools can uh, celebrate different things along the way that they want to celebrate within that. So I think that's the funnest part about it. And yeah, it's been an awesome response. No doubt. And I want to mention one more thing before we move on to the, the scoop and the, the job openings, uh, which I know is what everyone's tuning in for. Um, want to recognize like what went down in West Virginia a couple of weeks ago. There was a big vote in the Senate uh, for voting rights, which is a it's a no brainer bill that, you know, you would think would get passed. Uh, Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, and not to get too political, but just some background. Right. Um, uh, you know, was one of the senators that had the ability to think through or block the bill. And there was a letter that was penned to uh to Joe Manchin, uh, Nick Saban, probably the most famous person that signed his name on it, Jerry West, both guys from the state of West Virginia. That's the type of stuff that we're trying to encourage coaches to do. Use your platform and speak out for the good. Don't shy behind, right. you know, well, I don't want to upset our fan base or this or that. You know, I was, I, I, fr frankly, I was a little disappointed we didn't see anybody from West Virginia Athletic Department uh, sign their name on that letter or make any statements. That's the type of stuff we want to see is right. speak out, use your platform for something like voting rights or equality. That's not a political, should not be a political thing. It's like a human rights thing. Right. Uh, so get on the right side of it and use your platform. And, and we're here to encourage you and, and give you, that takes courage to do that and step out on a limb. We want you to know we got your back. You know we got your back there supporting you the whole time. If you choose to use your you platform. Choose to use your platform. Or anything in that in that realm. So just one. Yeah, I'm glad you touched that. I think it's I think it's one of those things when you talk about the alliance, and I'll ask you this question. I'll get a quick interview after I say this comment, but I think part of the vision was to be able to create with sports, there's so much power. And you originally talked about the DEI alliance with the things that were happening on at Ole Miss and in the state of Mississippi with the flag. So we'll go into that a little bit, but I think part of the the vision of the social justice roundtables was and the DI Alliance was just to one, create conversation, right? Create an awareness, give a safe space for people to talk and like work through this thing, which we all work with different type of people, races, um, sexes, whatever. And I think the part that happens, like you're just talking about is when it's a main topic, it kind of, people get courage, more courage because it feels acceptable. When it's not a main topic, it doesn't feel as acceptable. So we know that Adam, how he feels deep down and how, what he doesn't give. But I think even with the NIL, you know, Rising Coaches was about the NCAA, not NCAA property, and pushing that pretty aggressively before the NIL even happened. And I'm not saying that it's the reason, but I think those type of stands for things. And I think people were 
not willing to stand at that time and rising coaches was um in particular yourself was pretty adamant about that one and now it's a thing and now it's a main thing and now everybody it's accepted so i think part of the equality and inclusion night is just to be able to make it more of a main conversation a national conversation again so that people can feel reignited re-inspired uh reminded to just like let's just be on the right side of this thing like i said it doesn't have to be political it doesn't have to be just one topic there's a bunch of things that fall under uh, equality and inclusion so yeah let's just uh let's all be inspired and take our part no doubt no doubt i appreciate you saying that man and i'm i'm proud that we were like outspoken about the nil stuff because to me that's a that's an equality thing (laughs) Um, um and I'm proud that we were outspoken we, about the ETSU situation right. last year with Jason Shea, even though you right. know, maybe maybe legally we probably shouldn't, you know, there's like reasons people can't speak out because right, you know, there's probably NDAs and things like that. But like we said at the top of the show, be we don't give a fuck. I don't coach anymore. I can say whatever I want. I'm not trying to work at ETSU or or right. wherever. Right. And honestly, coaches. Like you guys shouldn't shouldn't care either because you don't want to work for somebody who who's going to be offended if you speak up for the right things. You know what right. I mean? You, have, right. you know, I know this profession is super competitive and there's not a whole lot of opportunities, but you know, you got to stand for something or you fall for everything, right? Yeah, and I think sometimes the hard part is to feel like it's an accepted space to be able to stand for something. So hopefully, again, equality includes night and it's over a span of. 14 days technically is over a span of this whole next 24 days uh, whenever you can fit it in. But anyway, um, I do want to ask what made you start the D or lead to start the DI Alliance and how do you feel like that has played into the things that's going on in the last two years since all the George Floyd? Man, I don't know that there was like some big vision behind it. I mean, of course there's some vision that came to it, Um, but it wasn't this like premeditated thing where like, oh, I'm going to start this company and then I'm going to start this DEI Alliance. It just came from what we were doing after the aftermath of George Floyd. Like, like we talked about, we just started doing social justice roundtables and like, you know, people were really, really hurting at that time. And there was a need for people to like congregate and get together and vent and discuss and share. And we were just all, doing our part, hosting these things and facilitating them. And you did it with all access. Ryan Price did a bunch. That was amazing. Cabral Huff did some, the the minority coaches association of Georgia did some amazing ones, especially on the football side. And so it just, and then you started seeing all these groups pop up coaches for action, coaches for change, coaches coalition for progress. And it was like, yeah, this is amazing let's all like get on the same page and and work together. Right. And so really all that, you know, I was trying to do is like, let's get everyone in the same room. Right. And then what we let them know from the jump was like, okay, great. We got some brilliant, powerful people in here. Uh, The problem is you guys all coach basketball. So from like, uh, like October through April, you guys are like unavailable. Cool. Rising Coaches has a little bit more bandwidth during that time. We can, like, let's figure out what initiatives we want to tackle. Right. And we'll have, like, we'll, we'll carry the torch during the season so that, you know, yeah. there's actually stuff getting done and yep. we're not just sitting here talking about it. And, man, I'm so proud of what we've done in a short amount of time. If you think about it, our mission is to impact change right. in the profession right. and then in yeah. our communities in that order and to address the profession uh, we've done some amazing work with our next up initiative yep. uh, that, that really has been the brainchild of, of yourself and Daryl Jacobs. Um, and, yeah, and that's been amazing directly give it like helped people get opportunities, right. not that they got it because of us. Kim, but. Kim Hampton too, of course. Well, and I was going to mention the, the women's empowerment series, yeah. which was Kim yeah. Hampton's baby, um, yeah. which was incredible to do an event like that um, specifically for women's basketball, yep. talk to some amazing coaches and decision makers to shed light on how women can get more opportunities. Yep. Our intro to coaching. I'm going off on a rant. I'm on my oh, this is good. This is good. This is good. You asked. Uh, 
intro to coaching, which has created opportunities in a, in a, in the first, as far as I know, the first resource for student athletes in men's basketball, because the WBCA does some great stuff on the women's side, yep. but there was nothing in men's basketball that provided a, a, a pathway for people to transition from being an athlete to right. getting into the coaching profession. And so, which, which was to, to interrupt you real quick, which was one of the takeaways from that time period, which was entry level positions. A lot of times minorities don't have the access maybe to get in or know how to plug in or where to plug into, which is part of what was a little bit of the brainchild to initiate it. And it's not just for minorities, but it's just for more student athletes to get a chance to get exposed to it. Because normally the only way you get exposed to it is if you actually accept a GA job, but now you're on the job, you know? So there's no like pre, like, this is kind of what it's like. This is what you'll be looking for. Here's somebody to ask questions to. So I thought that's been a, a really big deal and probably not celebrated enough. It will be, but not yet. Yeah. And that was a really special one. And, um, Again, yeah, over 50 of, participants, is that right? Over 50 and uh, over 40 of them ended up with jobs like right away. It was incredible. Right. Free right. event. All it is is just trying to expose student athletes to how they can get in. And it was cool because we had some people who were still competing in their college career, like as juniors, right. just right. trying to get ahead of it. And then we had some dudes and, and males and females that were overseas and like they were maybe like in their mid to late 20s. They'd already graduated, but they're still playing and trying to figure out, well, when my playing career is over, how do I leverage this into a coaching you know, career? So that was really cool. And so that's how I, I think we've already impacted the profession some and will continue to. No doubt. Um, and now begins the work to impact our communities. And that's begins with a quality and inclusion night. Yep. Um, and it's we're, we're following that right up. Obviously, Dr. Marcus Bright, um, who we've had on the show before um has joined now a part of rising coaches family yes i yes. was really a part he was a board member now he's in there with us now he's in the trenches with us on a daily basis senior advisor and what he's doing to galvanize uh these communities where we're really uh the extension of equality and inclusion night is to visit these campuses and expose student athletes to emerging technology cryptocurrency blockchain and how to make money with social media and leveraging that and getting that information to student athletes at the college level uh, who can then be advocates and share that knowledge and wealth in their communities where they're heroes, their hometown heroes. Right. So, no um, we're, we're working, man. I'm really proud of what we've done. It no really doubt. is just the beginning. Uh, it's been incredible. I can't wait to get the whole, um, because what the DI Alliance is, is a combination of 12 you know, it's 12 different social justice and minority coaching organizations. I can't wait to get all the groups together again. Right. This season can't end quick enough because I'm trying to get the band back together and, and figure out more ways we can have an impact. But uh, it's been incredible, man. I'm so grateful to you, to Kim and to Daryl, who have really, um, you know, given everything we're doing life and made all this stuff a reality. Um, and like, yeah, like we said, it's just the beginning. Yeah, it's been dope. It's just definitely just the beginning and uh, looking forward to more. And the, and the equality and inclusion night is definitely the biggest national thing because a lot of it before that was was impactful and, and was national in its own rights, but it was kind of exclusive to either our groups in the alliance or people that were familiar with rising coaches, where this is kind of an open door to get more people familiar with rising coaches and the work is being done and yeah, just to the positivity that we're working to continue to create. So I think that part about it is really cool because in the rising coaches will get introduced to a lot of people and this will be their first experience. Oh, that's the rising coaches thing. So I think that part is really uh, powerful too. So anyway, I know we got jobs and stuff to talk about, but that stuff was cool, but we do have a, a, a another, our first mini documentary that we uh, collaborated on DI Alliance. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. With with Coach Jones, Coach Rob Jones and Norfolk State was able to go on campus uh, right before the Rising Coaches Classic, which is the first ever uh, MTE by Rising Coaches. A lot of records being broken. But uh, yeah, Coach Jones, you know, I know Chris Paul did a great job with his work that he's done and continues to do with 
spotlighting HBCUs, and we wanted to do our own version of that. So uh, we chose that particular program because of the success that they've had. Uh, I don't know that there's a more successful HBCU program uh, in the last five or six years window as they are. There may be some of the similar conversation spotlight them and coach Jones and his program and get a behind the scenes mm -hmm. look and kind of learn a little bit more and see it up close and personal. So that's coming out the third, which is tomorrow night. So yeah, we got some fun stuff coming out. Uh, it's about a 15 minute documentary and get some inside scoops, some interviews, some highlights, the whole nine. So it'll be fun. Let's take a look at a clip. Let's Since do it. We're big time here now. We got that all this technology to do it here we go the uh, a sneak peek from the behind the scenes documentary of norfolk state basketball i mean coaching at hbcu is, 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 a, is a special thing you know it's a special place um, you know I, never, I didn't go to hbcu myself honestly um but i you know i went to a, a pwi but at the same time i am an african-american man and, and you take pride in and coaching um, at a hbcu so um, i just like the, the underdog factor of it i think i've been an underdog um, pretty much my whole life growing up the way I grew up and, and the, the constraints and things that I grew up in. Um, so being at HBCU, which is kind of like being an underdog, um, continuing. And, and, and I think that I've proved people wrong, even from, um, you know, growing up in my neighborhood. I want to continue to prove people wrong with the basketball program. You know, I want to show people that we can go out and beat anybody on any given night. We can compete with anybody on any given night. And it it's not going to be just a pushover if you schedule us. You know, I don't know about any other HBCUs or anything like that, but I just know when you schedule Norfolk State basketball, it's not going to be a, a pushover. And, um, you know, whether we have proven that time in time out with some of the big wins that we had. I mean, Coach, the Amazing. Great yeah. stuff. Appreciate your hard work putting that together, Brian. Um, be you're, You just wear many hats, man. You continue to add things to your resume every day. So now you're a, a big time producer and host. <laughs> yeah, something, something, something like that. Just a creator, you know, like back in the day when you play, just making plays, just want to make some plays, drop a few dimes. But that was a really cool. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Najee Murray, who is on the staff. Uh, sports admin staff at Norfolk State. He's the one that did the real work. Um, I just stood around and asked questions and talked about what we wanted to do, but he's the one that made it come to life. His information is at the back of the um, the last page or last segment of the uh, documentary. So tomorrow when it airs, you'll be able to see that, and it'll be on. It'll be housed on Rising Coaches Television as well on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, lots of great things coming. We're also doing a feature of the of the day every day for Black History Month uh, on social media as well, just to make sure we're still showing love. And, yeah, I guess we talk about some jobs. Now, where's John Beeline these days? I don't know. I love it. I love it. I don't know. I haven't I haven't seen or heard from John Beeline. Maybe we'll get an anonymous tip later on. All right, well, let's start off talking Louisville. We talked about it a little bit last week. Mike Pegues is, in fact, the interim head coach, which we, we guessed that he would. We kind of broadcasted the day all this stuff was breaking which is what part of the excitement of the carousel is we're, we're constantly getting news while we're on the air. Uh, and we'll get more and more as that time of year uh, ramps up. Mike Pegues, you, you said it, there's nothing he can do to, to win this job short of like taking him to like a final four run, probably. Um, yeah, they're, not, they're not quite a final four team. I don't know that they're not a tournament team. That's part of the reason why coach is not there anymore. So it'll be hard right. slash impossible for him to get it, but uh, we hope that he's able to get, another head coaching job uh, down the road for his career. Unfortunately, jobs like this, so high profile, you're, you're, you're letting go of a coach or parting ways with a coach who built an unbelievable program at Xavier during his time there. And obviously Xavier is one of those jobs that the name changes, but it just keeps rolling. Uh, so we'll give credit to Coach Mack there. And he'll land in a, in, on his feet, I believe, somewhere really good. But this job – uh, one of the names I've heard probably the most of all, and it's early, but Kenny Payne's most with this job that I've heard. Um, my understanding is that he's a graduate. I haven't confirmed that yet, but he it is. sounds like he played there, uh, played there, was a good player there, obviously doing some good work with the Knicks, did an unbelievable job with uh, Calipari, winning national championship there with Kentucky. So the recruiting part, he checks that box, the alumni box. He checks that box. People didn't like – now, the Mike Woodson hire was different because Mike Woodson had experience as a head coach, but he was an alum. 
people thought it was going to be a bad hire, and Indiana's in the top 25, and they're balling. So never know with these hires, but I think Kenny Payne's is definitely a name that I've heard a lot of, uh, and then kind of a dark horse couple of names that I've heard. Uh, Mick Cronin, I don't know if he wants to leave the uh, West Coast and all that. Uh, he's kind of a gritty guy, I think. I mean, we know he's a gritty guy, but I think the cold just kind of like – he belongs in the cold, so he can just show off his grit, you know. So he was at Cincinnati, now he's at UCLA, a final four. Uh, he's somebody who's been mentioned with this job and the Maryland job. He's been mentioned with both, probably more so the Maryland job, but he's been mentioned. Um, probably a couple others that I, I, I have heard recently. Muscleman, if they can find a way to get enough coin, I've heard his name. Uh, and then Steve Forbes is kind of a Probably a little bit of a dark horse name, but he's done a good job in Wake Forest in a short amount of time. Significantly higher profile job now. So those are a few names that I've kind of heard. Yeah, and this is one of those jobs too. Louisville, you talk about it, is, I mean, the resources to be a top 10 job perennially in college basketball. No and question. so this is the type of job you can swing for the fences. But let's just put this out there like, you know, let's let's nip this in the bud now. Um, the names that always get thrown around, Brad Stevens and Billy Donovan are not leaving being the head coach of the Chicago Bulls and being the GM of the Boston Celtics to come back to college basketball. So let's throw those names out right now. We don't need to talk about them the rest of the year. They're right. not, it's not happening. That said, again, Louisville is the type of job where you can take some swings uh, to try to hit some home runs. Yep. And I was just trying to think, like, who are some guys uh, – you know, that, that would yeah, right. that category that's proven that they can win at the highest levels. Why, you know, why don't we talk about Calvin Sampson? Uh, obviously where he's done at Houston, taking them to the final four, um, what he did earlier in his career, right. the guys did nothing but win. And, you know, Houston's a great job. It looks like it's a great fit for him. I'm sure he's very happy there, but why not right. take a swing at a guy like that? Um, I think he'd be fantastic. Another guy that I think has just been outstanding, and again, it sounds like he's found a great fit, but Mike Boynton over at Oklahoma State, what he's done there, um, again, they seem very happy. You know, I'm not saying that he's, like, trying to move on, but I think those two would be, like, home run hires, um, proven winners. Obviously, Calvin Sampson just has so much longer of a career and track record than a guy like Mike Boynton, but I don't think anyone's, like, done as good of a job in a short amount of time uh, at that high level as Mike has there at, in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Yeah, Stillwater is a not as nice of a place as Louisville. Sorry to people in Stillwater. I think that's probably well documented. But yeah. guy, by the, I got to I got to give you a quick. My guy, uh, Coach Richard Schmidt, who is a Louisville legend, coached Ballard High School for a long time, is my college coach at the University of Tampa. He used to always say about Stillwater, colder than a well digger's hiney. That was his phrase. <laughs> colder than a well digger's hiney. Oh, man. Shout out to uh, coaching that phrase. I don't know where he got that one from, but he I was like, full of them. He was full like of all it. kinds of – Richard Schmidt, Louisville legend. Yeah, boy, I think it'll be tough just because he just signed a big deal. Obviously, those deals can always be broken for more coin. Uh, I think he's pretty rooted there at Oklahoma State. Obviously, this job is just so high profile. So they can go after just about anybody they want, like you said. I think Kelvin Sampson, them going to the Big 12 makes Houston a different job because so much um, – I think two things with him. So much so much recruiting base is right there in Houston. So you have some of the best players in the country right there in Texas and in Houston. So I think that part – secondly, I think he's built Houston to a place – out of the dungeon, almost like a Bryce Drew in a sense of like it was in such a low place, not as low as Baylor, and then taking them to the Final Four. They haven't won a national championship at Houston with him, but he knows he can get there now. So I think it probably changed a little bit. And speaking of national championship and getting there, I probably shouldn't bring this up, but I'm going to go ahead and go there. Last night, you can see when a guy like Chris Beard leaves Texas Tech after helping build it, goes to Texas, which is the sexier job, and they are building this amazing facility at Texas, and it is his alma mater, and not saying he shouldn't have done it. That's greatly his decision. But you can see Texas Tech 
it almost has ignited to a whole nother level than what it was because there's so much like wanting to prove that they want to be one of the better programs. And that team is final four good in my opinion, because they defend and they can score. So I don't know. Sometimes when you leave a place for what's perceived as a sexier place, sometimes just keep building that place. Uh, no doubt. But, but the, the distinction I want to make, and I think it applies probably in that Texas tech, Texas scenario too. Uh, Calvin Sampson makes about three and a half million dollars a year at Houston, a place like Louisville has the the resource to pay you nine million a year. And it's probably similar to like Texas Tech and a Texas. But I will say this about Texas Tech, though. He was the third highest paid coach in the country, I believe, is what was documented in the country at Texas Tech. So they took away every excuse when they right. did. Yeah, and I understand that. But I also understand the human aspect where someone exactly. wants to cover your salary. Exactly. As a man, as a husband, as just a human being, I mean, come on, you got to think about it for sure. Right. Well, that's what's going on at Louisville. I'm sure there will be more names to come as the season goes on. Um, let's shift gears and talk about the other major job. And this is a situation that's probably not a top 10 job, but definitely could be a top 25 job. Uh, University of Maryland. Right. I have a lot of fond memories of it back in their ACC days. When I was at Clemson, we had some unbelievable battles. Right. Gary Williams won a national championship with Maryland. It can be done there. It's proven it can be done there. Unbelievable fan base. You're in a great city right in DC. What do you got for what do you got for Maryland? What do you got for the Terrapins? Uh I got a little bit. I was gonna let uh let I was gonna let you pinch hit on this one. I didn't want to be like always leading off and take mm -hmm. take taking any glory away from you. No, sure. Okay, I'll go first. I don't mind. Um the names I think that a lot of people are tossing around. <laughs> Kevin Willard uh, and the job he's done at Seton Hall, that would be a, a great hire. Um, obviously, he's won. He's in the area. Um, I've heard Rick Pitino. I've heard Rick Pitino's name for this one, and it definitely would make sense. He's he's in the Northeast, by the way. Iona is undefeated in conference play. They're looking like a tournament team again. That guy does nothing but win. And um, hold on one second. Oh, my goodness. It's a John Beeline watch. John Beeline spotted in Washington, D.C. He had the Terrapin tie on. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's a great fit or not, but I'm hearing John Beeline watch in Maryland. Look out. You never know. There could be a contract done today. Um, no, I, I don't know. I could see somebody like that. This is again, this is a great job. They could get somebody, you know, like a Hall of Famer to take it. But 20, plenty of young talent in the area. Rob Jones at Norfolk State would be great, who we talked about earlier. No one's won more than him in that region of the country. Um, so, yeah, that, those, are the, those are the ones I was going to throw out. Um, and also just want to recognize Danny Manning, interim head coach there, unbelievable person. Uh, again, I don't think it's going to be a situation where he's got a chance to retain the job, but what a great guy. He's doing a very good job holding down the fort there at Maryland this season. And we'd love to see him get another opportunity, um, you know, in the in the years to come. Yeah, those are good names. These things are always uh, – I don't know that you can ever be too off on these things because you just never know, and people can go in a lot of different ways. But my understanding, not that I have the inside source, my understanding is that uh, Andy Enfield is supposedly going to be the leader to get this job, his right to refusal, and – the word on the street is that he supposedly wants it. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, but Andy Enfield is the one that it sounds like is super tied into this one. Uh, I do think as people mention Kevin Willard and nothing against him, he is very, very good. I think it's, it's hard to not mention Ed Cooley because he's killing it in the, in the, in the big East. And a dude that just does it year in and year out, obviously not too far down the road, recruits the same region. Uh, so I just want to give Ed Cooley his flowers. They're winning winning the Big East right now and another really, really competitive Big East year. So, yeah, I wanted to mention him. He may not be even in the conversation, but if there was somebody that deserved to move up, he's definitely one of those other guys. Absolutely. Um, I just – Ed Cooley, to me, I always think about him like he's from from that area, played at Providence. Right. You know, it's such a great fit. He's done such a good job. He I don't may know really, he really. Yeah. But, yeah, he definitely should have opportunities. Uh, Nate Oates is another name that's been thrown around for – Louisville and Maryland. Um, you know, Dennis Gates is a name that's going to come up yep. until he gets a high major job and he'd be fantastic. Um, so yeah, lots of options. 
you know, another dark, I'll give you a dark horse. And I don't, I'm not saying that they'll go this route, but they should, they should entertain it. What about my guy, James Jones and the job he's done at Yale over the course of like 20 seasons? Right. I mean, for real, you talk about like proven winners. Uh, I don't know why James Jones doesn't get more love. I mean, he's turned Yale into a perennial, you know, power in the Ivy League. Not an easy place to win. It's not like they're Princeton with this great history either. I think the weird thing about the job thing is it's almost you almost get penalized if you stay too long at a place. Yeah. And it, even if you're not, even if you're still winning, it's like people just don't appreciate it as much. And I wonder if Shaka Smart even felt that at a point at VCU because he kept turning down jobs every year and he was the guy and he's turned down these high major jobs and he takes Texas, which seems like the one because it has all the bells and whistles. And he's killing it at Marquette, by the way. Um, again, no one should be surprised at that. If you are surprised, then you probably are discrediting what he did at VCU. But I think there's um, – yeah, I just think there's something about if you stay at a place so long and you've won over so long. I mean, I think about Randy Ray, who I just watched and broadcast the game the other day. They're leading the big sky. He coached Damon Lillard. He's done a tremendous job over a long period of time. And you almost just forget, like, oh, yeah, that guy's won a bunch of games. You know, Travis DeCure in the same leagues, won a bunch of games. You just you can kind of just get stuck sometimes if you've been there for a long time and you've just done a great job. It's like, oh, he's just going to stay there. You know, oh, he's just good where he's at. And then there's these other names that just kind of come out. And it's like, oh, it's the hot name. You know, it's like Dennis Gates. If he stays two more years at Cleveland State, it's going to be like, well, wait a minute. He's not even in the conversation the same anymore. Right now he's got all the buzz and deserves it. And I think he's going to end up getting his job, but you get what I'm saying. Sometimes when you stay at a place longer, this industry is weird like that. They almost don't appreciate it over time unless you do it at another place and another place. Yeah. T- timing is such a critical point to all this that you have no control over, but yeah, if you can hit it while you're, you're hot and the momentum's rolling, you kind of almost have to. I mean, you look um, at a guy like, uh, I'm thinking of what, what's the guy's name? Kyle Smith is at Columbia. Yeah. Then he goes to San Francisco. Now he's at Washington state. It's like all these things happen in such a small window of time you know uh there's plenty of other coaches natos you can go down the line but it's like when you're, you you got to strike while the iron's hot in a sense because that's kind of how the industry works unfortunately let's talk about a couple names of guys that we expect to hear uh for jobs this this off season <laughs> i'll start off um you know we mentioned dennis gates he's certainly won i think richie riley is a is a is a high major head coach by the start of next season what he's done in South Alabama is incredible, um, incredible. Uh, and throughout his career. Um, you know, Grant McCaskill is another guy who, you know, probably had some opportunities last year. Um, what he's done at North Texas is amazing. And then uh, how about the, you know, like guys, how about the job Andy Kennedy's done at UAB? I could see him getting another crack at it, although I think UAB is actually yeah. a great fit. Um, and then you got guys who are out like Sean Miller, Archie Miller, that I'm sure you'll hear uh, involved with jobs as they come open. Anybody else stand out to you, B, like that you expect to be? Yeah, I think there's a there's a handful. I mean, I think we, we just kind of mentioned in San Francisco just now. Um, I think Todd Golden's done a tremendous job. He's definitely a guy that's going to be mentioned. Um, there's a lot of mid-major guys that have made those moves up even in the recent years. Um, I think the Mountain West, I'm thinking about, League specifically, I think Nico Med- Meddev and uh, Jeff Linder are two hot names in that league that are, you know, vying for tournament position. Colorado State's in the top 25. Uh, I think those names uh, kind of go and get mentioned. Uh, I think so. Eric Conkle doesn't get mentioned as much as Grant McCaslin does, uh, but Eric Conkle at La Tech has done such a great job. Uh, won the conference last year, is competing to win the conference this year, obviously. North Texas has the tournament success. Um, I'm sure I'm probably leaving some out. I'm just going off the top of the dome. But uh, those are some of the names that come to mind uh, off the top. Obviously, Drew Drew Valentine's a brand new coach, but I would not be surprised uh, if he has opportunities fairly quickly. Um, I think Tavares Hardy is a dark horse for some of these higher academic jobs. He's done such a good job at Loyola. In a short amount of time, they were just in first place. I think they're in second now, um, but had an NBA player drafted last year 
from Loyola, which is probably never happened. So I think there's a lot of coaches that are out here that are kind of flying under the radar. I think Austin Clouch is one that's his name's been mentioned some last year at Nickel State. Just when you can do more with less, I think it's very attractive for the next place. And I think people want to figure out proven winners and people that have done more with less or done similar success with the same profile that they have. So a guy like those two guys are at what are considered low major programs, low major conferences, but they've done so well with less for Nichols and then somewhat with less, but high academic on that side. So I think there's some guys that are probably not being mentioned in some of the articles, but those guys deserve some due too. Yeah, absolutely. Two more names I'll throw at you before we move on. Mark Pope, Majavi's done at BYU yeah. and he's, he's a tremendous person and Matt McMahon, at Murray State, I don't know why he doesn't get more looks and opportunities. That dude uh, has Murray State right back yeah. at the top of the OVC and looking like they'll <laughs> for another tournament run. He's Yeah, many have them as the top mid-major in the country right now. I think they're 19-2 and two or 18-2 and two and looking every bit. They don't have a John Morant, but they're every bit as good as any Murray State team that they've had in recent years. They're very, very good. Um, yeah, so many good coaches that are out there. It's hard. It's kind of hard to just pick a handful. It's like you just want to go through each league and pick some guys that are really killing it. But there's definitely you know, lots of great candidates. And, and Mark Popes is different because they're now going to the Big 12 too. So he's got his Power 5 job and he's at BYU, which has incredible resources. I was able to watch a game there against Utah State earlier in the year. And Talk about a place now. Big time job, coach. Man, they love their athletics over there. It's like a, it's different. So I coached at Utah as well at one point, and that's the rival. And I don't want to say cold because it's a negative word, but it's just so powerful. Like the community of uh, the religion, along with just the BYU belief system. It's just like, yeah, those people are, and they have resources, they have money. The only thing they have to do is get Big 12 level money, but the longer you're in those leagues, the more you start getting the rev share of everything that goes on, and then it's a different different ball game. You know, the state of Utah is very underrated for their fan base. They got right. the best basketball fans in the state of Utah. If you think about right. it. All yeah, right, let's. And Mark Mark Madison's one. That's another dark horse name that we haven't mentioned. That won a, won, won a conference championship, uh, coach championship last year. Uh, one of those guys again, Chris Jans, uh, Bryce Drew. You got to mention those guys' names and kind of the guys that should be leveling up because when you win championships at a mid-major level, that's what people want to happen at the next level. So for sure, for sure. Okay. Um, two, two more low major jobs that we'll talk about briefly before we get out of here. We just have a couple minutes left. Sacramento state. I'll start off by just giving you the job rating, which we had fun with last year. Ryan Burton had some crazy ratings last year. I'm going to let you go. What do you rate Sacramento State? Oh, you, got it. you lead the way. You already got it. I'm, Man, I'm, I'm, I coached in the big sky. Sacramento State is not a good job. It's a very difficult job resources-wise, budget, everything. It's just difficult. Yes, you're in the city of Sacramento, which has some name recognition. Um, that's cool. The job Brian Katz did there over years was phenomenal. He had them competitive. Right. Um, they had some they had some really good years and then they would have some down years, but that's how it is at a job like Sac State. Right. You can't sustain it because they don't have the resources to sustain it. Maybe it's changed, maybe they've improved it. No disrespect right. to anybody at Sacramento State. Just my my view as a former big sky right. coach years ago, it was one of the lower jobs in that league. Um, but I, you know, let's throw out some names. Who knows? Uh, and also shout out to the guys on their staff. Sam Kirby, great dude. Know him going back to his um, Cal Poly days. Right. Uh, and uh, who else is there? Nate Smith, great dude. Been there for a long time. But in terms of new potential names, how about Adam Cohen, our guy at uh, Stanford, associate head coach there. Dave Velasquez at San Diego State. Uh, and Marlon Stewart. You talk about um, the rising coaches OGs. Those three are them. Those okay. three guys were there from day one with rising coaches. And it is cool because they're all three at the point where like they're going to get head jobs real soon. Yep. And they're all three like superstars in the making. So I don't know that they're going to end up. I don't know what this, you know, other than the fact that they're all three coaching on the West coast, they got any, got any, state, but, but they'd be worth a look for sure. Yeah. I don't know what the likelihood of them keeping the coach. I hope that they do just because it's a tricky situation he inherited and hopefully they at least give them a, a year to, 
get some guys in there and do it his way. But um, they've been competitive. They have a really, really good player that's a senior. Um, got a chance to see them up close too. But yeah, names. I mean, I think the the profile. Obviously, it's a it's a California job. You have to be able to recruit California, in my opinion, in that local area, kind of that Nor- NorCal, Northern California um, area. Yeah, I just think I don't have any specific names today. Next time I will, but um, I think somebody who is already in that region. So, like you said, Pac-12, uh, maybe Mountain West, WCC assistant that has some track record doing more with less. You know, I think that's kind of what this job is. It's not the prettiest gym, doesn't have the most resources. Uh, Sacramento has the location. Uh, it is a league that is a really competitive league, and you can still get enough transfers slash home guys slash guys coming back home. So I think you can win there. You just have to have somebody who's creative enough. It's not a high academic place, so I don't know if the high academic profile fits as much, but I think you can kind of get this thing with Juke, transfer, and then local high school or California high school guys. So, yeah, hopefully the guys there can get it done. If not, then I have to come up with some names for when it's actually open. I think you hit the nail on the head with the word creative. You need someone creative who can yeah. get it done. It's kind of like, and I, and I guess I'll relate this to Tim Miles. That was a, a very creative hire by San Jose State, which to that level league is so under resourced. Uh, despite the fact football has won and credit to the football program for winning the championship in Mount West a year ago, uh, San Jose State with 10 miles was a creative, innovative, outside the box hire. You need something like that, maybe not as much splash, but something like that in substance for Sacramento State. No doubt. Uh, the last, the last low major job we'll talk about today, really a no brainer. Open cuts, they, 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 would, they would say mid major, they would say mid major. So well, they can say, say whatever they want. The fact <laughs> is they're they're low major. <laughs> uh, no, Seattle, uh, Chris Victor is the interim head coach. They need to just go ahead and, and, and give him the head job. He's got them right. in first place. They're 17 okay. and four. Shout out to their amazing staff, Alex Pribble and Matt Jones, both Rising Coaches members. Yes. Both doing a tremendous job on that first place staff in the WAC. Get it done. Give them the job. What do you say, B? What do you no think? Brainer. No brainer. Not much to talk about other than how good they've – well, they've done. 17-4, and four, but I think they've won – what was you say? It's won like 14 in a row. I think Seattle's won maybe eight or nine in a row now. I mean, they're really, really good, and they've proven themselves against the best – some of the best in the league. You know, they beat Stephen F. Austin now. They beat Sam Houston State now uh, just this last week, so – They've proven themselves to be a legit squad, not just one that, oh, they haven't played the hard schedule yet. They've played uh, some of the meat and potatoes. They still have to play New Mexico State and Grand Canyon, if I'm not mistaken. But, yeah, they, he's no-brainer, should have the job. He's killed it. Love it. Love it. Well, B, I enjoyed it, man. As always, we'll be back next yes. week with more scoop and news and rumors from the basketball carousel. And by next week, we're going to be full swing with Equality and Inclusion Night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unbelievable work. Please, please, uh, if you're not involved with it, reach out, head to the DEI Alliance.org uh, for more information. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Yes.